special thank you to uh, Pastor Maroney in his absence. Um, I say it all the time. It's always with a, a sense of severity that our picture steps to the pulpit and deliver the word. It's nothing that should be taken lightly at any given time. And I don't intend to ever get it in my mind that it's something that's passive and something that's just casually shouldered and then handled. So I come to this pulpit knowing the responsibility that it brings. And I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, but without any, without any further ado, if you would uh, turn your, in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 3, we'll be reading from two scriptures and we'll revisit them again later. Uh, Psalms chapter 3, we'll be starting at verse 1. And then after that, we'll be going to Romans 8, verse 30. <coughs> Amen. Psalms chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 1 through 8. And it says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say in my soul, there is no help for him in God, say I. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, say I. I lay me down and sat, and I await for the Lord to sustain me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Rise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. And then, and then turning to Romans chapter 8, we'll be reading verse 31 through 39. And as I said, we'll revisit these scriptures later. But it says, What shall we say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. For it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then if you would allow me just a couple minutes this evening, I would like to speak to you over the topic, the conqueror concept. The conqueror concept. Amen. Why don't we go to the Lord and pray this evening? God, I pray that your spirit will speak to each and every heart. God, I pray above all else that you begin to focus us and show us in what you are then. Lord, challenge us. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us in what you see, God. Lord, I pray that you be alive into our lives. I pray, Lord, that you will lead us. Above all else, I pray that your will be done in this congregation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody said amen. amen. And then you may be seated. The conqueror concept. Now in order to fully understand a specific topic, I believe that you have to know, first of all, what it means. So before we go any further, let's, let's define conqueror. The word conqueror it can be defined in several ways. It's a very versatile word. It can be defined as one that subdues or one that takes control by use of force. This is usually in connotation with military action where areas of the enemy are seized and then commanded by an opposing force. It can be defined as one who may successfully overcome a problem or a weakness, something about their personality or something perhaps that they're dealing with. Something like conquering a fear or perhaps maybe a personal setback. Overcoming something that hits home to the individual, that affects nobody else but you. The term conqueror has, has even been used to describe those who 
have, su who have successfully climbed mountains or, or uh, conquered mountains like Everest or, or situations like that, it is attributed to those few who have stepped out with a purpose to achieve that which is impossible. But all these definitions and these terms, they all attribute to one single common ground. Individuals that are taking action against those things that are easily bigger and stronger than what they could ever be. They step out with the expectation to overcome those things which there's no way they could ever overcome. It wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to say that there are those with the courage to achieve the seemingly unachievable. Sure. Even through the hardships and even through the turmoil, in order to be considered a conqueror, you must refuse to turn tail and admit defeat. Amen. A perfect example of this would be the Spanish conquistadors who left their homeland to stake their motherland's claim in the new world. Many of us have heard of Fernando Cortez from our history classes. And they led a group of conquistadors from Spain on a mission to secure and explore land in the New World. It was a mission that would require time and it would require patience. It was a task that by all means was much larger than they were. And it was so demanding that it was likely that they would not succeed. But Cortez, who was the greatest conqueror of his group, he knew his men well, and he knew their tendencies, he knew their mindset. That being said, he knew that if there was even half a chance for them to run back to Spain, that his men would be distracted, wishing to escape all these hardships and to, to completely abandon the mission for the sake of going back home with their families and going back home where their life was. With this understanding, Cortez ordered that his men empty the ships and then burn them as soon as they landed on the shores of Mexico. So the only thing that they had was their supply. Because Cortez knew that if the escape route was cut off, that his men had no choice but to focus on the mission at hand instead of focusing on the opportunity to turn around and admit failure by taking the easy route. Because they were conquerors on a mission, you see. They had a purpose to be where they were. And conquerors don't lose. And to admit failure in the face of adversity was to admit defeat. And that was simply unacceptable. If you intend to live a victorious life, if you intend to be a conqueror, you cannot look at the problem. You can't look at the circumstance and run in the opposite direction. It's something that you have to face head on. Yeah. Our life is filled, it seems, with things that we simply just can't handle. On a daily basis, we're constantly reminded of how small we actually are compared to the giants that surround us. I hate to say it, but it's the grim reality of our day and age to submit to the idea that there's no way that we can overcome our situation, that there's no way out of the conflict. It's too easy at times just to give in to a misguided sense of hopelessness and to just give up, thinking that there's no way that we can ever win over our circumstances, that we are completely overpowered and that there's nothing that we can do. And I, I tell you tonight that it's a disheartening thing because every day I meet people who are, in a manner of speaking, content living in fear of their own giants, allowing their poor circumstances to dictate who they are and how they live. Ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you this right now, that that is not truly living. That is not living a full life. If you cannot stand up in victory in the name of Jesus, then you can't stand at all. God does not intend for anybody to live a defeated life. That is not how we were designed, but rather, we are designed to live in victory. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, and verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. But what is that, what is that implying? To give you an expected end. An expected end of what? An expected end of peace, not of evil. Paul stated it clearly in our text. If God be for us, who can be against us? The Almighty, the God of peace. The creator, the Savior is on our side. That means no matter the enemy that we face, 
No matter the circumstance that we go through, if we are one of His, then we will emerge victorious. Yeah, right. I think we need to understand exactly who we are and exactly who we serve. Yeah. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We must understand that we are more than conquerors. There is a specific mindset that comes with that, a kind of thinking, if you will. No matter what come my way, I will emerge victorious over each and every circumstance. There is no situation. There is no addiction. There is no shortcoming. There is no devil in hell. There is no angel in heaven. There is no principality. It requires a level of faith in God 
that says that no matter what, I know that you are by my side. I know that through you I will emerge victorious. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter the enemy that I face. If I wake up tomorrow morning and everything is gone, I know that I have still a solid foundation in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Paul laid it out in scripture and we read it. Folks, we've been bought with a price. We have been purchased yes, and I believe for a purpose. See, Jesus was nailed to a cross and he suffered the effects of our sin. And through that, Jesus paid a debt that we could never afford. Right. Because of this, he gave his life so that we could live in victory, and I don't mean this in just a trite term. I mean truly live in victory, not just experience it for the moment, not just sit for a day and say, yes, that was good, I finally overcame. But I'm talking about living in the understanding that because of his sacrifice, we can now live a life of abundance right. instead of a life of half fears and failures. But we have to, it seems, run behind corners to, to dodge the enemy. No, we, we live with an understanding that above all else, we serve a God that will pull us through. Nobody ever said it was going to be easy. But if we are conquerors, then we will be victorious. I'm about to close. If you miss this point here, and you've missed the entire concept. Once we accept Christ, and once we accept His sacrifice for us, once we repent, and we go down in the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, and we are filled with the Holy Ghost, as Acts two thirty eight explains, we become marked as different from this world. Right. Amen. We become marked as separate. We're no longer known by our own name, but rather the name of Christ is invoked over us at baptism. We're no longer our own, we are His. And living under His grace, brought us, brought to us by His act on God, we can truly live an overcoming life. Because once we're His, who is it that can stand against us? Who is it that can stand at ends with you because there is somebody in your corner that's not in theirs because you are marked as his. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because after all, it isn't by our own power anyway. It isn't by anything that we could do that we could ever overcome, but it is through him. And it is through him alone that we are more than conquerors. Right. And then if you would please stand every head down and every eye closed. Sometimes life can be a chaotic mess. Sometimes we don't know exactly how we're going to push through. We don't know how we're going to see tomorrow. It seems like everything that's been promised to us has been cast aside. It seems like there's adversity on every hand, but I tell you that there is victory at the foot of the cross. There is victory when you lay your burdens down and put them in hands more capable than yours. See, that's the key. Are you willing to let go of the circumstances? Are you willing to truly accept who you are in God? Because if that answer is not an unequivocated yes, then we've already messed up. When we finally let go, when we finally break, and we, we leave it in the hands of God, we understand that the circumstance will work out far better than it ever could in our hands. And so I tell you this much, your burdens... Your circumstances, are you willing to lay it down at the foot of the cross and take up the title as more than a conqueror? Better yet, are you willing to take up the title as one who was marked by the power of God? Are you willing to be a conqueror through Jesus Christ? I pray that you would come to this altar and I pray that the circumstances and the burdens that you have on your shoulder, that you would lay them at the foot of the cross. I pray that you would allow God to move on your heart and begin to take situations. I pray that you would allow God to touch your life. These altars are open.